Okay, thank you, Charles. Welcome everyone to today's meeting of the panel, both those that are participating and to those who are watching from home. If you're having te technical difficulties during the meeting, then please contact the Democratic Services Officer on call who will attempt to assist you. Today's Officer on call is Emily Kennedy and her number is 577046. I would ask participants, when you are not speaking, please mute your microphone. This minimises background noise and will help everyone in listening to the proceedings. Microphones must only be on if the participant has been granted to permission to speak. And to gain my permission to speak, please very briefly indicate on the chat to the right side of the screen, and I will then make a note and go back to you once the person speaking has finished. Would everyone present please ensure that their mobile phones are turned to silent and that they are not used to make or receive calls whilst the meeting is in progress. Please also refrain from checking emails or conducting other business and ensure that you're in a quiet room free from distractions for the duration of the meeting. Please note that this meeting is being live streamed for members of the public. The meeting will also be recorded and will be subsequently broadcast on the internet. Moving on to attendance, can I ask members of the panel to confirm that they are present in the meeting when I read out their name? I will ask for the attendance of those councillors who are participating in order to speak under council procedure, Rule 21, separately. So if you can confirm you're here, Councillor Campbell. Yes, I'm here, thank you. Councillor Boyd. Yes, Chair. Councillor Coleman-Cook. Here, Chair. Councillor Hopkinson. I'm here, Chair, yeah. Councillor Huxley. I'm here, Chair. Councillor Keane. Here, Chair. Councillor Moore. Here, Chair. Chair. Councillor Patmore, Councillor Paul Moore. Present, Chair. Councillor Linda Piper. Here, Chair. Councillor Rattigan. Here, Chair. Councillor Wing, who's substituting for Councillor Roper. Here, Chair. Councillor Rosecki. Councillor Rosecki. Not here yet. Councillor Scott. Here, Chair. Okay. The following members have asked to speak under Council Procedure Rule 20.1. When I say your name, please can you confirm that you are present in the meeting? Councillor Stuart Piper. Here, Chair. Thank you. Could I just record Councillor Rosecki's apologies? Councillor Linda Piper's mic went off. Okay, no problem. Thank you Thank for that. You. Is anyone substituting for him? Do you know Councillor Piper? No, it was very short notice. We've just found out. Okay, thank you. Uh, Councillor David Saunders. Here, Chair. Mm -hmm. Councillor Bailey. Here, Chair. Are there any more members who would like to speak under 20.1? No. We have public speaking tonight. Um, Ms. Michelle Thomas has requested to speak under Agenda Item 7, Memorial Plaque in Broadstairs. Uh, is Ms. Thomas here? I am here. Thank you, Chair. Thank you. Uh, apologies for absence, Agenda Item 1. Uh, Councillor Roper substituted by Councillor Wing. Uh, we know that Councillor Rosecki is now an apology. Are there any more apologies? I don't think so, because I think everyone else reported in. No? Okay, fine. Um, declarations of interest. Do any members have any declarations of interest they wish to make at this point? No? Okay. Agenda item three, minutes of previous meeting. To approve the minutes of the overview and scrutiny panel meeting held on the 26th of May 2020, copy attached to the agenda pack, please can I have a proposer and a seconder, please? Councillor Campbell proposes... Thank you, Councillor Campbell. So find a seconder. Councillor Coleman Cook, seconder. Thank you, Councillor Coleman Cook. Now, unless I hear any objection, I will take this these as approved. Silence is deafening, so these are approved. Thank you. Um, agenda item four, cabinet member presentation, beach management plan. Um, I will call upon Councillor Everett to make his presentation. Uh, the main question that's been put to him is how is the beach management plan working out? And in the light of experience so far, are there any changes likely to be made? Councillor Everett. 
Thank you, Councillor Byford. Um, and thank you to the committee for this invitation and this opportunity to talk about what is obviously a very pertinent subject this summer, um, as it always in is in Thanet, but I think particularly this summer with the uh, post-lockdown surge in numbers that we've seen coming to our beaches and the measures we've had to take to, we've had to put in place in order to manage that. So um, if I can ask the officers to put up the presentation so that members can see it. Uh, which was the plan. <laughs> Great. Okay. Right, so I'll, I'll just talk you through that. Um, obviously, um, you're aware that we put in place a beach management plan. I think the intention was always that the beach management plan should be dynamic um, and that we should respond to um, the situation that we found on the beaches, also to the input that we receive from members, members of the public and our partners. Um, so it's very much a work in progress, but I think it's already proven a useful document. Um, can I have the next slide, please? So as I said, the beach management plan is currently on the website. Um, you'll all have seen that, I think. And there's a new publication, which unfortunately has only been circulated in the last hour or so. Um, but I do uh, commend it to people. Um, this is a beach safety booklet. It's primarily designed for our partners. So it contains a lot of information about um, contacts, uh, about what's allowed on the beach and what's not allowed on the beach. And it's a sort of handbook, basically, which would be useful to um, the people running concessions on the beaches. Uh, to the RNLI, to your leisure, I think particularly to councillors. Um, I think it's it's too comprehensive a, a publication for uh, the general public, but we are looking to do a version, uh, a consolidated version of information which is um, useful to the public. But I think you'll agree when you do get a chance to review it that it's going to be a very useful publication. Um, next slide, please. So um, the issues, and we'll go through them um, one by one, that were raised under the beach management plan. The first one was obviously antisocial behaviour, um, a perennial problem. So what we've been doing is we've had security patrols on the beaches and promenades at Margate, Main Sands and surroundings. Um, I think that's from 12 to 8 p.m. now. I think that time's slightly changed. That's a response to um, what we've seen. Um, and there is security in Broadstairs, which I know and we should acknowledge is being provided by the Town Council uh, and on the, on the Broadstairs bays. Um, there are bay inspectors who are proactively engaging with the beach users. Among the things that they're uh, doing, I believe, is giving out black bags, um, because as we all know, uh, rubbish on the beach is a major problem. Um, and the bylaws, which we'll come on to in a minute, are being used to inform and challenge uh, visitors when breaches of the rules are observed. Uh, what the council's now put in place, I think for the last three weeks, um, is a, an additional weekend beach supervisor um, who is working for TDC. Um, and their job is to, they're, they're on call until eight o'clock and their job is to take an overview of what's going on around the coast, um, to act as a single point of contact and to deal with proactively with issues as they arise. And I think that's a really useful thing. It gives us an overview um, of what's going on and a, a central point of contact. Um, we've had an increased enforcement presence out um, by the duty supervisors who are educating and challenging people. And we've had regular patrols from the Education Enforcement Officer and the Dog Warden Service. Um, can we have the next slide, please? So the bylaws, I mean, if anybody's looked at the bylaws, um, and they are on the TDC website, um, obviously they're fairly ancient and they're not particularly usefully presented in terms of the way that they were created originally. So they do need some bringing up to date. We put them into the new beach safety booklet, and that's been circulated, as I've said, um, and we're producing a public version to help raise awareness. At the moment, the uh, bylaws can only be enforced by prosecution, um, and that 
means in effect that we're only going likely to take prosecution to to, to proceed to prosecution with people who are serious or persistent offenders um, we don't think that's satisfactory um, what we want to do is review them and bring them into a public space protection order which will allow us to issue fixed penalty notices against them but obviously that's a formal process and has to be done over time and it's not something that we can bring into place this summer um, but we are in the process of improving the improving the position with the bylaws um, other things that have happened and are happening additional signage um, has been created and distributed along with uh, barriers and bollards where needed to restrict access and we know as i'm sure many of you have heard that there is a particular problem with jet skis um, actions being taken to contact persistent offenders and cctv is being utilized but one of the things that's going on there is that canterbury city council is carrying out a consultation on um, introducing a a proficiency test for jet skiers um, that consultation i understand runs until august the 31st what would concern us about that is that it could lead to displacement of people who have been causing problems on the coast at, at canterbury onto the thanet coast so we're going to look and see whether we ought to try and do the same thing um, of course, the problem with jet skiers is always going to be that you've got to catch them. Um, if they're in the water, that's not necessarily that easy. Um, but we don't want to be in a position where we pick up a problem from Canterbury. So we are going to look and see whether we can do the same thing as Canterbury. And that's something which is still under discussion. Next slide, please. Uh, the issue of parking, um, in particular, um, we know that in around some of the small bays is a problem. Um, we have got um, civil enforcement officers out patrolling seven days a week. You can see that the number of penalty charge notices is up sharply, um, no doubt in line with the extra visitors who've been coming. We've got access to use the electronic signage on the A299 to warn visitors, in particular when Botany Bay is busy, because we know that that's an issue, um, to try and divert people to alternative uh, facilities. We've got static signage to try and direct vis visitors to places where they can park legitimately. Um, and we're working with the police to address the issue of obstructive, dangerous and inconsiderate parking. That, I'm sure members know, is quite commonly misunderstood that TDC doesn't currently have the powers to enforce against obstructive, dangerous and inconsiderate parking. Um, however, we are looking again at a public space protection order, which would give the council the power to issue fixed penalty notices against those offences in future. Um, so again, it's, it's one where we're playing catch up slightly, but I think what's gone on this summer to some extent has been, um, you know, has, has not been what, what we would normally have expected to see coming out of the lockdown. And therefore we're having to take the steps to catch up with it. And some things we can do now, some things obviously will take a little bit longer. Public toilets. Well, there's another issue which um, we were left playing catch up when the, uh, when the lockdown was released in May. Um, it says on the slide that all main beach toilets are now open with extra pools to lose at Margate Main Sands. There is in fact an exception to that, which is the Marina Esplanade toilets in Ramsgate, but I'm assured that they are going to open on Saturday. Um, and the other toilets which have uh, been contentious, although they're not exactly on the beach, is what I think are called the Screaming Alley toilets, toilets on the West Cliff at Ramsgate. Um, there's a problem there with the door, with the roller shutter, uh, we're in the process of getting that fixed and we hope to have that open in the next few weeks. Um, I think the current the current expectation is the first week in Margate. I know Councillor Wing's particularly interested in those toilets, so I'll just include that for her. Le uh, Leader, I think you might be a slide behind at the moment, or you might be in front of the slide. Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, can we go on to the next slide? That's my. That's because I'm looking at them on a different display, Councillor Bay, right. for my purposes. Sorry, okay. so... Um, yeah, it's just over toilets. We've got the extra sanitary bin emptying now in place because that's been something which has come up as needed. We've got extended opening times now until eight o'clock for the busiest sites um, because we had, um, when we first reopened the toilets, we had complaints about the fact that we were closing them early. Obviously, the evenings are, are very light at the moment. So where they're busy, they're being closed progressively, but where the busiest ones are being closed last. And obviously, because of COVID-19, and this is what's really caused the issue with the toilets, is we've had... Um, extra cleaning staff on duty um, because they have to be cleaned regularly during the day and we've got static cleaners based at the three main at the three main beaches um, I think that um, the opening of toilets in uh, the private sector in the pubs and restaurants 
has probably taken a little bit of the pressure off that issue. What we've been dealing with up to now is a situation where we were providing the facilities for everybody and obviously everybody was on the beach because they couldn't be in the restaurants and cafes. So I think that situation has eased a little bit, but we are aware that there are particular problems with capacity in particular places and we're going to continue to monitor that. I'll have the next slide, please. Lift closures. Well, as you know, we've got two lifts, one at Ramsgate and one at Viking Bay, and they are both currently closed. Um, they're closed because of social distancing and because um, we don't think at the moment it's possible for us to manage social distancing. Now, we are aware that there is an issue with disabled access at Viking Bay, um, and that although there is side access to the beach at Broadstairs, it's not ideal. So we have discussed this at some length, and I think we're going to carry on discussing it. But the problem is um, we don't believe that we can have more than one household in the lift under social distancing. Um, even if we restricted the lift to disabled people, we would need somebody to supervise it at the top and somebody to supervise it at the bottom to control access. Um, and obviously the cost of doing all that, seven days, would be astronomical. Um, and the assumption is that the queuing at Viking Bay in particular would be um, lengthy because obviously it's, it's a very popular facility. So we haven't resolved that one at the moment. There may be options to offer a limited service at weekends. We may be able to use volunteers. Um, I don't think it's realistic for us to put two members of staff on there uh, seven days a week throughout the day. Um, members may have their own views about that and I'm sure we'd be keen to listen to them. Can I have the next slide please? Um, ensuring all the businesses on our beaches and foreshores have sufficient licenses and insurances in place. Um, yes, well, that's obviously necessary. I mean, not only do we have what might be lawful activities who are trading without permission, but we also have people who are carrying out trades. I think sale of nitrous oxide is one which uh, keeps coming up um, unlawfully. Um, so there's a, there's a level of enforcement going on there, and we are endeavouring to make sure that people on the beach um, do have the appropriate license and obviously the problem if people come and, and trade on the beach without a license is that we can't manage that activity we can't decide whether it's appropriate and we can't uh, we can't decide whether it's whether that's the right thing for that particular area so um it can be a bit bureaucratic but i think you can understand that we need to be in control of, of what's going on on the beaches next slide please uh, illegal launching of boats um yeah, working with the water user group, we've sent out reminders about the rules uh, where launching is prohibited and uh, particularly about keeping barriers closed, which seems to be a problem. Individuals breaching the rules are being challenged and will have their membership of the water user group rescinded if they persist. Uh, barriers and bollards have been installed to tackle non-permitted launching of jet skis at Margate at three sites. New sites at the Barnes car park barrier and slipway and discussions are taking place with local jet skis to work in partnership to tackle safety issues and, and identify offenders. And obviously jet skis potentially are very dangerous um, if people are in the water um, from the beach and they're not controlled properly. So that is something we do need to keep on top of and I've referred to that earlier. Um, and there are a number of other measures being considered to deter illegal launching and unsafe activities. Next slide, please. Beach huts. Well, I hope that this problem is now over. Obviously, um, due to the timing of the lockdown, uh, the beach huts would normally put in, be put in place in March um, and uh, it wasn't clear to us until May that they were going to be um, available for use at all this summer. Um, staff, and they're mainly dealt with by your leisure, staff have been furloughed and then there was a problem of actually physically getting them into position during a period where the promenades were busy. Um, so obviously there was a safety hazard but um, I think that with uh, your leisure's assistance we've now got to a position where everything's in place and uh, the your leisure bay inspectors are working to deal with any operational issues as they arise next slide please um yes litter um i had the uh, i had the pleasure of uh, visiting um broadstairs viking bay on the morning after the hottest day of the summer um and i have to admit that i didn't get there till eight o'clock um, and there was still a huge amount of rubbish on the beach um, and I know that the team there have been working really hard since six o'clock and I'm you know from talking to them I'm hugely impressed with their commitment to 
um, clearing the beach, but we do have a massive problem and it's an ongoing problem. It's not a problem which is limited to Thanet because I think we've seen uh, Bournemouth and Brighton have had similar problems in, in relation to the number of people they've had on their beach and what they left behind. But we are working hard to manage it. Um, we're going to provide another 50 beaches, large, large 50 beaches, another 50 large bins, um, in, which will be distributed in appropriate numbers around each of the bays. Um, and we think that bigger bins that are half full uh, look better than small bins, which are overflowing. Um, but there is a, a problem of getting the public to use the large bins. We've got crews working from six in the morning until eight at night, seven days a week, emptying the bins. And they'll be deployed for the rest of the season until eight o'clock. Um, there's a beach surf rake daily to clear out litter between five and nine o'clock. Um, seaweed is removed daily when the tide allows. Uh, we've got beach supervisors and cleaning supervisors liaising to resolve issues swiftly as they arise. And we've got the enforcement education officer liaising with the community groups, partner agencies, and learning establishments to nurture positive behavioural change. So I don't think there's any getting away from the fact that this is a continuing challenge for us, um, but we are continuing to increase the number of bins and we're putting more and more resources into it. Um, so we're doing everything that we can to resolve it. Well, the next slide, please. Um, beach safety, well, we've um, I've sort of covered that in the booklet, which um, has been distributed, but it does talk here um, about how we're working more closely with us, with our uh, partners. I will say that um, Chief Exec and I had a very useful meeting with um, the other agencies online a couple of weeks ago. That included the police um, and the transport um, operators, um, the railway. Um, and we had an interesting discussion about what they could do to manage people coming out in and out of Margate in particular. Um, and I do get the impression that what has happened this summer is that everybody is working together to a much greater extent than has been the case in previous years. So the, the pressure on the system has resulted in some quite good partnership working. Um, and as you can see, that's reflected in, the, in this slide about the discussions that are going on, meetings with the concessions and the Bay inspectors, weekend coordination with the beach supervisor, the RNLI on duty at seven bays now, not the full set that we would normally hope for, but much better than they initially thought that they could provide for us, um, and the use of volunteers at Bay inspectors at the other beaches to give safety advice. And... Uh, the next slide, which you'll be pleased to hear, is the last one. Um, it's worth talking about comms, I think, because if we don't tell people what we're doing, um, not only will they not know, but we won't, they won't understand what the, the, the council is taking responsibility, that it sees the problems that are occurring and it's trying to do things about them. Um, so, you know, I'm, I'm full of praise for our comms team. We've got a, a particular bespoke communications plan for dealing with the beaches. As you can see on there, there's a lot of um, social media messaging going on, um, which hopefully in particular will get to, to younger people uh, on Twitter. Um, there's been the usual engagement and press releases going out and uh, unfortunate television viewers will have seen myself and Councillor Alvin on a number of occasions in which we get about 10 seconds to say something significant about Thanet before they move on to the next speaker. But we do our best. Um, and obviously it's been, I think, the number one issue for people in Thanet over the summer. Um, and I'd just like to say a special word of thanks to Jasmine Vickers, who's worked very hard on all these things, um, is coordinating it and helped put together the presentation. And I'll take any questions. And members, could you indicate on the sidebar if you'd like to uh, either ask any questions of the leader or indeed uh, if you've got any comments that, that you would like to make? Um, well, while people are thinking about that, um, Councillor Everett, um, I've had a couple of members of the public that have contacted me with some queries, many of which you've covered in your presentation, and, and thank you for that. Um, but just to try and pick up any that, that I think you might have missed here, um, there's some questions regarding barbecues and um, bylaws that, that do or don't exist and what enforcement is taken. I mean, they've been particularly aggravating on certain beaches. I wonder if you could comment on that, please. Yeah, I think we don't allow barbecues uh, before 6 p.m. Um, that's my understanding of it. Officers might be able to uh, advise on the enforcement that, that's going on around that. 
I, I th well, the, the comment that was made to me is some suggestion that the bylaws applied to groups, uh, barbecues where the groups are, exceed 12 people. Yeah, there are there are there are bylaws. There are different bylaws for groups, aren't there? Yeah. Um, I mean, the bylaws are contained, as I said, in the beach safety document, which we've circulated. Okay. And another question that's been raised is whether, um, and again, you've alluded to extra signage, but I think there was a, a, a sort of promise early on that there would be more notification of bylaws on signage. And the question is whether um, we could be more proactive in putting very of layman's terms bylaws uh, and signs up in the main beach axis yeah i think that that's that's what we're alluding to in relation to the beach safety guide that we would have it's one of the things we would have is to distill some of the key messages what we don't want to do is produce a lot of um signage now um which is then overtaken by the review of the bylaws which is going on um and um then we bring in the um the public safety protection order in order that we can enforce them next year because i think we'll want to do bespoke signage for that but that is definitely something we're doing okay thank you um another question again you, you've touched on one aspect of it but a question of uh, whether we have an enforcement policy on the use of uh, laughing gas canisters being used on our beaches well i think that's i think that's against the law isn't it i, I don't know would you would you like me to shall i just come in there um the, the the I think the nitrous oxide. I'm not sure what the current terminology for it is, but those canisters are legally uh, obtained. Uh, I think we are we have raised this matter with the uh, district commander uh, and also with the East Kent um, uh, superintendent. So um, they are aware that this is an issue, um, and um, we are. I have I have asked. Uh, the district co commander to attend a, a member's briefing to uh, provide a bit more of an update around how they're managing this situation but it is something that is on their kind of radar um, I think there are some challenges around how they actually address it though because as I say this is legally obtainable so uh, at the end of the day unless actually they're carrying out antisocial behaviour in relation to that sorry about the background noise uh, then um, uh, I think it's limited uh, in respect of what they can do. Gavin, I don't think I don't know if there's anything else you wanted to add. Oh, there you go. There's a national guidance paper that has been produced, and he's can send the link round. Okay, there you go. People know. Uh, people are more, far more updated on this. That's good. Thank you. Right, moving on to to other members. Um, Councillor Scott, you've got a question. Uh, many thanks, Chair. Um, yeah, just uh, just two questions, really. Um, just regarding the beach management plan, many thanks for the, the presentation. I've uh, also just got it up on my phone here now. I'm just trying to find the answer to my question. I can't sit. Uh, with regards to sea uh, weed removal, um, do we have a list of the beaches that those are focused on? It's just, um, I mean, we, we're having, obviously, a problem area around the, the Birchton and Westgate area where the, the, the actual seaweed itself has now left to festered and it's yeah become a quite a focal problem um debatable on both sides some say leave it other people say remove it but what is the situation for those uh, particular bays apple bay i think it is west bay and st mildred's that's my first question thank you uh yeah uh, yeah councillor i can answer that uh, we've we've put the information on the website as you can appreciate we use a contractor to remove it and you've got to consider that uh, a lot of that that materials on soft sand and therefore actually access to it is is prohibitively dangerous so what we do is is we can get access to the main beaches and what we do is try and clear the main beaches as much as possible but some of the smaller bays it, it is incredibly difficult to get access to remove that material Okay. May I come back with that, Chair? Yep. Yeah, is it going to be a likelihood that the, the council can look into investigating and reviewing that? Um, I mean, obviously, it's a seasonal thing, so in we're, we're going to be expecting it on an annual basis. Just wondering if that could be something that may be reviewed and how we can remove that. Not necessarily all the time, even just a one-off removal would be beneficial, I, I feel, on these sort of instances. Uh, yeah, I'm, as you can appreciate, I've, I've previously indicated to, in, in briefings that uh, we do take that material 
to a third a third party and they, they spread it on the land and that's done under an exemption which is provided by the agency and there's a restriction on the amount of material that can be put on that land. So obviously what we do is we try to, to link the removal, quantities removed, to what we can actually uh, dispose of because if we had to send it for landfill because that's where it go otherwise, it would be prohibitively expensive as you can appreciate. Okay, thank you. Um... Yeah, and so, I mean, just to go on to my other question, it was just um, in relation to the, the promenades, really. Um, I know, obviously, we've got the bylaws, but for the Westgate uh, area onwards, just the, the signage for the cycling and just making, obviously, the pedestrians aware that to expect cyclists and, obviously, cyclists to be mindful of the pedestrians, it's another debate we have over it. Okay, I've got some good news on that. We we, we did a briefing and a cabinet report a couple of weeks ago and they approved expenditure on signage. Uh, we've ordered that signage and that signage is either due at the end of next week or the week after and we'll be putting that signage out and that is signage where there's pinch points, as you can appreciate, when you come off the large prom onto smaller proms in some of the areas, having signage about shared space, etc. And then part of that briefing was also you'd uh, the government have released quite a lot of money to county and we're working with county to try and get some of that money to put actually dedicated lanes in etc to significantly improve that separation okay good i will certainly look forward to that and love to be part of it if there's any assistance you may want on that thank you thank you councillor campbell uh thank you very much uh thank you for the presentation leader uh i've got, got three or four questions um, you mentioned the fact that there's a, going to be a weekend beach supervisor who's going to go around looking for particular pinch points and areas of difficulty on the beaches. Uh, is this individual or series of individuals going to be contactable by members to point out particular problems that they find out? If so, what are their contact details? My second question is, what is the process for changing the bylaws, particularly into PSPOs? And thirdly, why are there no beach huts in Ramsgate? <laughs> well, <laughs> some, some hardy perennials there, Councillor Campbell. Well, this is very um, true. Unfortunately, yeah. that's the case. Yeah. Um, the weekend beach supervisor, we had a discussion about that yesterday, and um, we're quite keen that members should be able to contact the weekend beach supervisor. But I think that um, on, on, we have slight concerns because I think members need to understand that their role would be to highlight issues which are ongoing perhaps or which need need to be brought to the attention of officers but we can't have for example members ringing up and saying um, i demand you come and empty that bin because that's not the role of members so uh, i know most members do understand that but occasionally things do arise where those situations come up but i think we are looking we do think that that's an appropriate thing for members to be able to do to contact the person who's on duty um, and bring things to their attention and i know that members get frustrated by what they see um, around the district when they're out and about so that is an opportunity um, in terms of uh, the process I don't know what the process is if I'm totally honest and I'm sure officers can advise us about that in terms of um, turning the bylaws into PSPOs um, and um, Councillor Campbell you know that we've discussed endlessly um, the fact that um, there, there are no beach huts in Ramsgate um, I'm sure that the council will be delighted to find opportunities for beach huts in Ramsgate particularly as they would generate revenue and we will continue to look at it. Uh, yeah, councillor. In terms of the PSPO, you can, it's quite it's quite a long process. You can appreciate because at the moment we're just doing the review of the dog fouling one, uh, and the officers are just going through that process. Uh, there's quite a lengthy, like I say, process and consultation. So we will be going through that process. It's likely to to stretch into next year, but we're fairly confident that we'll have that in place for next season and that's really important because it then gives the powers for all our enforcement officers to carry out enforcement action through the issue of fixed penalty notices there and then on the spot which is obviously significantly more uh, effective than than actually trying to chase somebody through continuum persistent breaches and trying to take them through the court of law and getting their, all the evidence so if we can if we can issue a fixed penalty notice for somebody that's breaking the the bylaw there and then it, it would sig significantly improve behavior hopefully so just a point there is one uh what you can actually stop me talking about beach huts in ramsgate is to actually install some <laughs> right mo moving on <laughs> uh councillor wing uh 
Uh, yes, thank you, Chair. Uh, I think it's following on from the public safety protection order. Again, I'm not, I'm not aware. I don't know what's involved in the process, but I, I visited an area actually where my mum lives and they have, they seem to have a public safety protection order across the whole of the London borough. So I'm wondering, and we know we've got issues on some of our open spaces that are similar to some of the issues on our beaches. So is it worth pursuing looking at a borough, a, a district wide public safety protection order that covers some of the antisocial behaviour that we see on our beaches and we also see uh, in our other in our other areas, town centres, and I know some town centres have already got them, but are some of our other open spaces. Uh, why don't we just do put all the all the hard work into one one application if it's possible and just create a district wide public safety order if it's possible. Uh, I, I can appreciate London boroughs, but obviously London boroughs are quite small areas. They have lots of money and have lots of resources to be able to enforce it. So, I mean, we can look into it. Uh, I think one across the whole of the, the district might be problematic in terms of enforcement because it's all right having those powers, but we need we need obviously staff out there actually enforcing them. But I mean, I, I can look in, into it and, and I can get back to you in terms of how, how we'd be able to uh, do that. Okay. okay. Thank you. Thank you. Councillor Paul Moore. Yeah, sorry, Paul. Chair, I couldn't find the button quickly enough. Okay. Uh, okay. Thank you, Chair, and thank you, Councillor, for your presentation. Um, I have three points. The first one is uh, looking at the booklet that's been produced, um, the, it shows the designated areas for boat users, sailboats, speedboats, water skiing, um, but it shows fourness. Fornes Bay, but it doesn't show them as being PWC users. And um, PWC is Power Watercraft, aka jet skiers. Uh, and you have two jet ski clubs either side of that bay. You have Fornes Water Ski Club, and you also have Jet Ski World. Um, so, just wonder if that, if, if it's in the booklet, is it set in stone, or have we just, is that just an oversight on what we've done there? Uh, secondly. If we were to broker a communication with those two clubs, we would find out that they have strict policies for the way jet skis are used. Um, namely, all boats have to be registered, so they have a number. So if you can get the boat number, you can then deal with the individual. Uh, all boat users have to have insurance before they can be launched. All boat users and jet ski users have to pass the Royal Yachting Association qualification for both speedboat and for jet skis, PWC. Um, so there's your uh, policing policy in hand to deal with that. And likewise, as the last caveat, um, the water user group wishes to see all those documents before you can actually get a water user's key so you can get access to the seafront and to the promenades. And if all those are in place, then we are policing it. And it's not just uh, jet skiers that are uh, sometimes found to be mischievous we've also got boat users that have speed boats that aren't insured they just buy these boats bring them down and use them so i know we're saying we've got an issue with jet skiers but i i also used to be a pwc user um but i had to sell my toy for marriage unfortunately so i've lost my toy um but then um, these boats you know you, you get people that are just as dangerous going into bays uh, on speed boats uh, and I appreciate it's awkward, but if they're all registered and they've all got ID numbers, we can police it a lot more proactively. Um, so that was, that was that point. And the last one is regarding Councillor Scott's mention about the seaweed issue. Um, I don't know um, what the benefits are with the seaweed, but I am aware there are two, um, two farms at the moment. One is at the junction of Sandwich Bay and Pegwell Bay, which produce um, electricity from the methane. And you've all seen those bullets down by um, Sandwich Bay. And it's the same company that's produced one at St. Nicholas. And they, use, they used to use all the fallen fruit from all the orchards and uh, farms that do that. They used to cut all the grass at Manston Airfield and take all that silage away and use that to produce methane. Uh, because they were allowed to take it, they didn't mind going cutting it. And I just wondered whether we should get in contact with them to see if they can take the uh, at the uh, added seaweed away and use that as well for methane. Because they've got tractors, they've got means of collecting it, uh, and they're willing to use it because they're making something out of it. I didn't know whether we as a council had looked into that, and maybe we could look into that. Thank you. 
Uh, yeah, I mean, if you, if you send me all those details, we can we can definitely have that conversation with them. Uh, and in terms of the bylaws, I don't know whether it is an oversight. I'd, I'd have to I'd have to check or whether it, it just it just isn't included in the because some of the as you can appreciate some of the bylaws have, have been in place for some significant amount of time. Okay, thank you, Councillor Linda Piper. Councillor Linda Piper. So I'll come back to you, Councillor Linda Piper, if, in the end. Um, Councillor Keane. Too late, he's gone somewhere else. Oh. Um, I'm here, Chair. Is that any good? Uh, yeah, OK. Better um, like ever. Okay, I'd just like to uh, thank the leader and uh, Jasmine for this comprehensive uh, report to protect our beaches. Uh, I haven't seen them quite so full in all the years that we've lived here. And I'm looking forward to reading the booklet. So thank you very much. Thank you. Right. Councillor Keane. Yeah, thank you, Chair. Uh, mine's just a question. As well as litter, there's a problem with dogs mess on the promenades. And are there any measures being taken to target this specifically? And can more dog bag stations be put up? Uh, I, I know we had the ticks packs, didn't we? And mm. I, I'm, I'm, I'm not aware whether they've been refilled because of the COVID issue, but we can we can get the ops guys to have a look at that. In terms of of the enforcement of the dog fouling, is yeah, the, I mean the enforcement officers that are out and about do have the powers to if they do catch people. But as you can appreciate, it's it, mm. it's, quite, it's quite we cover quite a large area, and it's quite difficult to catch people actually doing it because lots of people are doing it sort of early morning or, or sort of late on the night. But if we do catch yeah. them, we take appropriate action. Okay, thank you. I oh, thank you, members. I, I can't see anybody else uh, wanting to comment. Um, can I, on your behalf, thank Councillor Everett for the presentation? Um, and I'd ask members to to note um, the, his report, uh, and I'd ask the leader uh, to take note of the comments that have been made by members when considering beach management plan further. Thanks very much. Uh, noted. Okay, thank you. Right, moving on, agenda item five, procurement of lift refurbishment program and external repairs and decorations program. Call upon Bob Porter to introduce the report. <clears throat> thank you, Chair. Uh, good evening, everyone. Um, yes, this, uh, this report deals with the letting of uh, two contracts within the housing revenue account. The first for the refurbishment of uh, passenger lifts and the second for external works and uh, decorations um, of these contracts mean that their letting is a is a key decision um, which is separate to the decision by full council to set the budget in the first place um, and uh, the the report that's before you tonight is going on to cabinet on the 30th of July um, asking for that key decision to be made um, effectively delegating authority for the two contracts to be let. Internal works and decorations contract is uh, what's uh, known as a term partnering contract, meaning that it runs for a period of time and, and the scope of works can be varied during that period. Um, the funding for that is within the agreed housing revenue account revenue budgets um, covering the contract period. Um, the lift contract is a capital works contract uh, funded from the major repairs reserve um, and um, there is actually there's a separate report going to cabinet on the 30th of July um, reviewing the capital program budget um, in line with the pre-tender estimates for for the for the refurbishments of the lifts on the list in this contract um, that um, the uh, cabinet uh, are be, are go, will be reviewing the HRA budget for the rest of the um, year from the 1st of October onwards um, on the 30th of, of July and recommending to full council uh, the adoption of a, of, a, of a varied budget including the additional funding to complete the lift contract. Um, I think that's all I have to say by way of introduction um, and obviously any comments that members have this evening um, can be considered by the cabinet when they see the report on the 30th of July. Thank you Bob. Uh, Councillor Campbell. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Bob. 
Uh, yes, uh, whilst I uh, fully support this uh, particular program, and thank you very much for presenting it, Mr. Porter. Um, when he was mentioning lifts, I was thinking about Royal Harbour lift in the car park. And I just wondered whenever that's going to be replaced. It seems to be out of order on a regular basis. There was a program to renew it. I wonder if that was still in the in the Capital Works program. I know it's outside of this particular agenda item, but we were talking about lift refurbishments. Thank you, Councillor Campbell. Yeah. It is outside of this item. It is outside, yes, Bob. Yeah. I need to respond to that. It, it is outside of this particular paper, Council Campbell. I'm sure we get back to you outside of this meeting on that matter. Okay. Never yeah. missed an opportunity. I'm sure Councillor Campbell knew he was in the wrong from the start, but there I we are. I certainly did. Some, some things never change. Um, <laughs> Kevin Hopkinson, you'd like to make a comment. Yes, thanks, Chair. Um, it's, the, the, it's just about procurement here. So the report notes that uh, quality and cost analysis will be taken into account. And I just wondered if uh, we could just ask Cabinet to consider taking into account uh, community wealth building principles for procurement, if possible, as well. Uh, Bleeder? Uh, sorry, uh, Chair, I'll turn my microphone off. Um, yeah, I think Councillor Hopkinson make, makes a good point and Cabinet will, will give that attention. OK. Uh, Councillor Wing. Thank you, Chair. Uh, fully support the refurbishment of the lifts. Uh, I've been in the three that exist in uh, Ramsgate and I know Harbour Towers uh, residents had great concerns, not just about their lifts, but also about the presence of CCTV within those lifts and within the building. So as part of the refurbishment, will we see finally see some decent CCTV in those lifts? Um, yes, I can I can respond to that, Councillor Wing. Um, se separately to the report that's here tonight, there is work already underway to install upgraded CCTV on all of the council's tower blocks. Um, that it's finished in some of the blocks already, and that program is progressing through all six blocks. Uh, and those and then some of those new cameras will be linked back to the CCTV control room as well. So. So yes, that that installation is um, that contract is underway at the moment, and that installation is coming. Thank you, greatly appreciated. Okay, I, I can't see anybody else wanting to make a comment. Um, so can I ask the panel that uh, we we note the report, and again ask the cabinet consider the comments that have been made by members in the debate. Noted. Thank you. Um, thank you, Bob, for your presentation. Right, moving on, agenda item six, criteria for any review of street and building names and other monuments. Um, and this, of course, is in the light of uh, obviously very topical stuff regarding the suitability or otherwise of um, monuments and, and names of buildings and streets. So could I ask uh, Tim House to introduce the report, please? Thank you very much, Chairman. Yes, um, as, as you've already said, this is about um, the spotlight being put on uh, buildings, street names, etc., from following the Black Lives Matter campaign. And clearly, it would be better for the authority if we had a policy in place to um, cover our consideration of, of such matters. And this is merely just a, a first attempt, really, to uh, perhaps come together with some sort of criteria or factors members would like to see in such a policy and once we've um, given that some thought then i can go away and draft a policy and probably bring it back to this committee to um, have them look at the complete policy just one other point i want to make is that um obviously in any policy we have to take into account the um public sector equality duty which is set out in the report as it as indeed it is in all our reports which will of course have an overriding impact as well on any policy but it's really particularly about an open discussion now to say what factors are there that members think we should be taking into account in constructing a policy in this particular area. Okay, um, thank you, Mr. House. Um, Councillor Whitehead, do you'd like to make a comment? Thank you very much, Chair. Um, obviously, this is a significant issue. Um, 
I believe it has always and it will always be of utmost importance to consider what our priorities are as a society and as a community, um, how we view ourselves as a community and how we ensure that we're all heard, recognised and respected. I'm aware very much so that I'm speaking here from a position of comparative privilege, disabilities notwithstanding. I've never been discriminated against because of the colour of my skin. I feel very much that I can only speak here from the position of an ally. I do not have the right to own the experiences of others. It's not for me to speak for those who have experienced racism, but I can use my voice to allow others to speak. And I believe that that is our role tonight in relation to this issue. We're here to consider equity as well as equality. History isn't static. It's ever developing and how we address our history and how we view it is mutable, fluid and an important dialogue and process. I believe strongly that our view should always recognise those communities who have been affected by and continue to be affected by our history and that we should be guided by the equalities legislation that allows us to do that. In light of that, I would like to remind members of the requirement under the Public Sector Equality Duty, Section 149 of the Equality Act 2010, to have due regard to the aims of the duty during this discussion. The aims of the duty are to firstly eliminate unlawful discrimination, harassment, victimisation and other conduct prohibited by the Act. Secondly, advance a quality of opportunity between people who share a protected characteristic and people who do not share it. And finally, foster good relations between people who share a protected characteristic and people who do not share it. Our strength as a chamber and as a council is our ability to communicate clearly, calmly and considerately. I am exceptionally proud to be part of this council and of this chamber, and I'm also proud of how well we are all capable of working together to represent the whole of our community. It is our duty to our community to do so tonight and to advocate for those who are affected by racism and who share protected characteristics. I know that we can do this, and I know that we can discuss this issue respectfully in consideration of those who are directly and indirectly affected by racism and in a way that ensures that all views are heard to find a positive way forward. All of us here want what's the best for our community. And tonight we can do this by listening and considering how best we care for all of our residents. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Whitehead. Uh, Councillor Linda Piper. Uh, thank you, Chair. I agree with uh, Councillor White Whitehead's um, uh, comments that she has just made. Uh, we must be uh, within the law of any uh, plaques that are put up, any statues that are put up. Uh, but one of the criteria uh, perhaps we should consider is the time in which the people lived, uh, what they did, the effect on the uh, society at that time. Uh, we mustn't try and hide our history, uh, be ashamed of it, but have it out there and have people informed of, of why the plaque is there, why the statue is there, and let people make up their own minds. These things need to be informative as well as within the bounds of the law. Thank you. Okay, Councillor Campbell. Uh, yes, thank you. Uh, thank you, Bob. Um, I think it, what's becoming evident to me is that this is not an issue that can be determined uh, by peripheral discussions at an overview and scrutiny meeting this evening. Isn't this particularly an issue that, uh, that uh, requires the raising of a working party to discuss this issue in depth, uh, to discuss it in and come forward with some cogent ideas and views on this particular issue to be determined and uh, raised at full council or even by the overview and scrutiny committee and then perhaps go on to full council if uh, decisions need to be taken. So I propose that a working party should be raised to deal with this particular issue in depth. Okay, does that find a seconder anywhere? I'll, I'll second that, Chair. Okay, thank you. Um, uh, next speaker is Councillor Boyd. Thank you, Chair. Um, my point was very similar to um, Councillor Campbell's uh, in the fact that it should have either a working group or it should come to a scrutiny. Um, I also think perhaps 
how do we judge what um, we are going to review? So could there be a way for the public to um, submit if they have found an offensive um, plaque, monument, street name? How do we get that public voice into the council? Is it by an online submission, that kind of thing? Um, and again, sort of having a criteria as to what we would mark it against. I can take the point of everyone that um, had comments, um, particularly the, the comment about the time and the history. I think it's more a point of um, what do we do after removal? What do we replace it with? How can we take more ownership into the local um, population? Um, and again, finding that that judgment, um, but I would probably want to seek further guidance and also perhaps for all protected characteristic groups um, that are within planet. So again, um, ethnic minorities, LGBTQ plus TI um, communities. Um, and again, I do have having a working group, obviously make it cross party as well, and obviously make it um, a political, um, again, that probably goes without saying, um, but that was all my comment really. Thank you, Councillor Boyd. Uh, Councillor Hopkinson. Thank you, Chair. Um, yeah, I agree with uh, a lot of the things that have been said already. Um, I think it is, it, is, it is a valuable thing for us to consider um, criteria, which we'd want to have in place. Um, but I wonder if it might be better to think of those as guideline criteria to give us a chance to reflect on each you know, issue case by case. Um, uh, just a couple of other things. I, I mean, I agree with uh, Councillor Whitehead's you know, point that, uh, you know, reviewing, reviewing our history sometimes is is a good thing and um, it's an important thing to do, especially if, you know, we know that sections of the, the community are concerned about, about things we have in place at the moment. Um, I agree with also with, with Councillor Boyd and Councillor Campbell. Well, it's implicit in Councillor Campbell's co uh, point, I think, that uh, public involvement in the decision making is, I think, very, very important um, in this issue going forward. And just finally, um, on the issue of, you know, I mean, there's been talk about with the outcome of the, the item after this, um, about whether, you know, we could um, remove something from, from a public place and put it into a museum. I think it is important to bear in mind there is a difference between displaying something publicly like a plaque and putting something in a museum, being that if something is a plaque or potentially a street name as well, that that's a kind of a sort of endorsement of something, whereas in a museum it's not necessary endorsement of the thing of, of the thing that you are displaying there, especially if you contextualize it. So I think that's worth bearing in mind. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Councillor Wing. Thank you, Chair. Uh, I don't think we can make decisions unless we've properly explored the impact anything has on any particular group within our community. So I think it's really important that we make attempts to engage with those sections of our society which are, are likely to be more affected. We, we are clearly, as a group of people, speak from a particular, uh, you know, generally speaking, a, a, a white perspective of our community. Uh, and I think it's really important that whatever is done, that we reach out to those sections of our to all sections of our community to find out uh, what the particular issues are for them as as uh, councillor whitehead said we cannot talk from various perspectives we can only talk from our own perspective so it's really important that we we get we gather as many perspectives as we possibly can to get to the truth of the situation Okay, oh, Councillor Wing, I agree absolutely. I agree with everything that's been said in terms of the fact that this isn't a, an issue to be taken lightly at all. Um, it does need an in-depth review. Um, we have a proposal and a seconder that we set up a working party. Uh, and uh, I, unless anybody uh, wishes to show dissent, um, I'll take that as a recommendation from the, the panel. Um, what I'd like to suggest is that Perhaps Councillor Campbell and myself uh, can uh, have discussions uh, with officers and uh, consider the potential makeup of that working party. And perhaps we could circulate members of the panel to get their comments on it. Um, the reason I say that is that um, I think it's important that we get this underway as quickly as possible. And if we sort of say tonight, well, we'll go away, think about the makeup, we'll bring the makeup to the next ONS panel meeting we're just losing more and more time so um, would members be happy say with the proposal that Councillor Campbell and myself go away 
uh, discuss with officers and other parties potential makeup, circulate members for their comments, and if we get general agreement, we can set that working party up sooner rather than later. Yeah, okay. that's a good idea, Bob. Great. It's fine with you, Bob. Councillor Campbell. Thank you very much. Okay, so uh, that's agreed, members. Thank you very much. Um, move on to agenda item seven, a call-in of an individual cabinet member decision, the memorial plaque in Broadstairs. Now, what I would like to do before we, we start the debate on this is to remind people that uh, really we're not here, uh, if you like, to ask Councillor Everett to defend his decision. Um, we're here to examine whether the leader could have used a different process to come to the decision or, or to reach a decision concerning this issue. Um, so can I call upon... Uh, Michelle, Michelle Thompson, who wishes to speak on, sorry, Michelle Thomas, sorry about that, who wishes to speak on this matter. Thank you. Um, right, I'll just um, read what I've written down, if that's all right. Okay. Um, there can be no doubt that the Uncle Mac plaque is offensive by modern standards. Minstrel shows were famously grotesque mockeries of black people, reinforcing racist stereotypes. However, does this mean the plaque should simply be removed? I don't think it should be, and I'm speaking as a black woman here. I don't think it should be for several reasons. Removing it without a due process and consultation would be a mistake. Tokenistic gestures such as faulty towers being taken off BBC iPlayer just confirm to people their suspicions that this is political correctness gone mad while doing nothing to actually tackle racism as it currently exists. The merest suggestion that the plaque might be removed has provoked a backlash by people offended that the idea that their history, pardon the pun, is being whitewashed. Tensions are running high in Thanet. This sort of action can actually make things worse for the very communities the council is trying to protect. I believe instead that the plaque should be left where it is. I don't actually know where it is. I've been to Broadstairs lots of times and I've never seen it. Um, and I have seen the Clangers mosaic. But I believe it should have some sort of educational addendum to it, explaining the context. And as Mark mentioned, um, sorry, Councillor Hopkinson mentioned that you can put these things in context, but leave it up. I mean, after all, Uncle Mac was hardly the most egregious example of minstrelsy. I'm old enough to remember the black and white minstrels on TV on Saturday nights. My concern over statues, plaques and other monuments is that they become the story and we forget the real story, which is systemic racism and white supremacy. Will getting rid of the Uncle Mac plaque change anything for black and brown people in Thanet? I doubt it. More dangerous still is the idea that if we remove these statues and plaques, we've fixed racism. Um, it's, it's a, it becomes a distraction. I mean, um, racism is far more deep rooted and pernicious than that. Gollywogs were still being sold at Dickens Week as recently as 2018. But it, the real racism, the everyday racism, is what sees black people 40 times more likely to be stopped and searched by the police, black women five times more likely to die in childbirth, <clears throat> and the editor of Vogue told to use the loading bay to get into his own office. If we are sincere about tackling racism, serious, complicated work is necessary, not just tearing down statues. We need to reform our education system. We need to shine a light on the slave trade and colonialism and the British Empire. And we need to teach children about the ancient civilizations of Africa, Asia and South America. This work obviously is outside the scope of the council, but I believe a meaningful conversation with all members of the community or their representatives would be a good place to start when discussing Uncle Mac. I think we need to show that history is being amplified and extended, not erased. And I believe that racism is toxic for everyone, not just its victims. Thank you for letting me speak. Thank you, Ms. Thomas. Thank you very much for that, that contribution. Um, Councillor Stuart Piper. Uh, thank you, Chairman. And can I take this opportunity to thank Michelle Thomas for her insight and her comments? Um, I guess it depends on how much history one reads about Uncle Mac. It, it seems from his history that he performed in tribute to very much appreciated and very skillful musicians from a different part of the world. 
at a time when very few local people, if any, would ever get to see the real thing. I think, well, for me, all issues to do with racism are based on intent, um, although I recognise that's a contentious view to hold. His entertainment wasn't considered racist then, and I wonder if it's right to suddenly automatically consider it all as being racist now. I believe perhaps it should be better understood, and the emphasis on the people of today, myself included, of course, is to ensure that there is no racism now, in our time. We learn from our history, and how does a society learn if it destroys its own history? I believe we have a responsibility to all our residents not to act with haste about Agenda Item 6 or indeed this one. I urge the panel to recommend that the plaque remains where it is until the criteria from Agenda Item 6 are known and implemented. Thank you very much. Thank you, Councillor Piper. Councillor David Saunders. Thank you, Chairman. Thank you, Chairman, and uh, good evening, uh, panel. Um, I'd like to... Uh, amplify exactly what Councillor um, Piper has said with regards to the presentation by Michelle Thomas. Um, as Ward Councillor, this um, memorial was in Viking Ward and for the benefit of Michelle Thomas, it's actually on the promenade, which is directly in front of the square where she saw the mosaic plaque. So for a little bit of background, I'd like to confirm to those panel members who don't know where it is or the background to the uh, memorial that James Henry Summerson was a popular seaside and musical entertainer and an exponent of the musical genre that was already been mentioned, commonly known as Dixieland minstrel music, which was extremely popular and a legitimate form of entertainment up until the late 1950s, which is the TV show that... Um, Michelle Thomas referred to. When in character, and I think it's important to remember that, when in character, Uncle Mac, together with his minstrel troupe, entertained Broadstairs residents and visitors for over 50 years from, nine, from 1895 to 1948. And as a measure of his popularity locally, the memorial, um, and also reflective of his fame, was unveiled in 1950 by Annette Mills of Muffin the Mule fame. Sorry, and, could, sorry, could I just stop you there, Councillor Saunders? Councillor Campbell's got a point of order he, he wants to make. Thank you. Sorry. Yeah, sorry to interrupt, but uh, I think we're missing the point of actually what we're here to debate. I think you laid it out initially, uh, 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 Chair. Uh, we're here that a, a process for removing or boxing up this particular plaque was taken by the leader. And whether or not he should have used that particular process, whatever it was, or a different process. I mean, we're not here to discuss whether or not racism is good or bad. It certainly is awful and terrible and shocking. And I'm not here to actually um, defend racists. But the reality is that that's not the point that we're here to debate. We're here to debate what process took place in the actual boxing or removal of the plaque and whether another process should have taken place. Thank you, Councillor Campbell. I'm, I'm sure Councillor Saunders is aware of that. I, I think that, um, I, I, well, speaking for Councillor Saunders, I know he can speak for himself, but I think he was here as much as anything to sort of uh, put the point of view that were expressed at Broadstairs Town Council when they uh, considered this matter. But perhaps, Councillor Saunders, if you could concentrate on the process uh, side of it, um, I think, you know, we, we know where you're coming from in terms of uh, explaining Uncle Mac. Yes. OK, fine. Um, I'll leave out a little bit of the history. Um, I would like to say that the plaque, the wording on the plaque, for those people who haven't seen it, reads, in memory of Uncle Mac, J.H. Summerson, who entertained the residents of Broadstairs for over 50 years, he brought joy and laughter to young and old. Now, this matter was discussed by Broadstairs and St. Peter's Town Council on the 24th of June, and... Uh, we had three options on the table for debate and consideration, and we elected to go along with option three. The wording of option three was 
the memorial should remain in situ and only be removed as a if a petition from the residents of Broadstairs and St Peter's requesting its removal. And I have to say as ward councillor that I and my fellow ward councillor have received no such requests. We've received numerous emails and telephone calls in support of retaining it. it I appreciate it's a difficult situation, a difficult decision, and I hope that we can agree on a process moving forward. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Councillor Saunders. Uh, Councillor Linda Pipey, you wanted to come back? Thank you, Chair. Um, uh, Councillor Saunders and Councillor Piper have kind of stolen my, um, not thunder, but some of the comments that I was going to make. Uh, I'd like to uh, thank Michelle Thomas. Sorry, sorry, for Councillor Piper, sorry, can I just stop you there? It's my yeah. fault. I've, I've sort of read this out, out of context, really. Um, Councillor Saunders was the was the uh, speaker under 20.1. We still had Councillor Bailey to hear under, under that. Oh, issue. sorry. Sorry. So, no, my, my fault. It's um, okay. Councillor Bailey. Uh, good evening, panel. Um, yeah, I think I've misjudged this, uh, the reason for this um, item as well. I have sort of covered uh, part of the process in as much as um, I do think that generally the public, as well as us maybe, find it difficult to understand and accept a decision by, you know, unilateral decision by one person. Um, and, and I'm talking generally now, not just about this issue, but... Um, obviously, obviously uh, generally um, and I do think it's right and proper that it does become come before overview and scrutiny um, I might you might think I'm digressing a bit but I think this is another reason why I'm going to bang the drum for the committee system governance because uh, uh, councillor, can, I, can I stop you there councillor Bailey that's yeah. the of this debate sorry yeah I know I was just saying it wouldn't fall on one shoulder in one person's shoulder um, I, I, again, I, I wanted to speak because I'm a ward councillor for um, the location of this park. Um, and Councillor Saunders has said that we passed it, but it was by a very, very, as you know, Chair, very narrow uh, margin, eight votes to seven, I believe it was. Um, so it, it's not a done and dusted thing at all. Um, and reading, I, 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 I suppose appreciate... there a minute. I think I think we need to make it clear that I mean Broadstairs Town Council were only sort of, if you like, debating this in an advisory capacity. Yes, and, yes, I realise. Um, yeah. I, I mean, Councillor Saunders has gone through it in some detail. I don't think really we should go on. If if you've got points other than the, the that were raised at that meeting, fine. But I think there's no point in talking about the outcome of that meeting any further. I think we've established where okay. that. Was. Well, I, I just want to say thank you to Michelle Thomas for her comments because I think she is spot on there as well. And and I agree with the, um, I know it's, sorry, it's previous agenda item, but with the, the working party, which all it rolls into one, I believe, with this agenda item. Uh, yeah. That's what I'll say for now. Thank you. Yeah, I, I think you're right, Councillor Bailey. Yeah, absolutely. Um, <laughs> Councillor Paul Moore, um, I'll bring you in, but can I ask you not to repeat anything that we've already been through as far as the Broadstairs decision was concerned? Certainly, Chair. Uh, firstly, strangely enough, I'd like to thank Councillor Everett for his proactive and speedy uh, shielding of the plaque, um, because otherwise um, it could have been uh, irrevocably damaged by those protesters that went out to do that. Um, but my point with future decisions for Broadstairs would be, would it be possible for the leader to maybe liaise with Broadstairs Town Council uh, particularly myself as chair of Borsters Town Council and my town clerk, so that we are uh, we're, we're a part of the decision making for these kind of things. Uh, that wasn't really done and communicated to us. Uh, it was something that he did uh, in that particular instance, and I thank him for it because he saved the plaque. But in future, it would be nice if we're part of the process. Thank you, Chair. Okay, thank you, Councillor Mark. I can't see any other members of the panel, so it's an appropriate point to ask Councillor Everett if he would like to, to speak at this point. Thanks, Jerry. I would like to speak. Um, firstly, I'd like to say that I'm not naturally somebody who goes around looking for um, historical artefacts to remove or dismantle. It's not 
it's not my way of, of looking at the world. And I think that um, in terms of the discussion that you've had about future measures, we should be very cautious about doing that. Um, because I think it's a, history is a complicated subject. Um, I, I'll, I'll, I'll explain a little bit about my thinking, but just in terms of what actually happened, um, a, an operational decision was taken by officers to box in the plaque prior to the uh, Black Lives Matters uh, march between Ramsgate and Broadstairs in June. Um, that wasn't my decision. Um, but I was aware of it and obviously I support it, but it was an operational decision taken by officers quite appropriately to protect the plaque because the plaque was identified by them as something which had caused controversy in the past and was likely to become a focus um, of the Black Lives Matters discussion. And indeed, it subsequently did become a focus for reasons that we needn't go into tonight. But I think that there is an established... Uh, there is an established lobby in Thanet that would like to see the plaque removed. Now, I, I absolutely accept that there are people who have the opposite view, and that, I'm, I'm not disputing that. Um, in terms of how the decision is made, um, as Councillor Bailey's alluded to, this is our system of governance, um, in which decisions, non-key decisions, can be made by um, Cabinet members. And I was well aware when I made the decision that there will be an opportunity for it to be called in and I welcome it being called in and I welcome the discussion that's gone on about it since um, and the input of members. Um, I wasn't aware when I made the decision uh, of what exactly had gone on at Broadstairs Town Council. I've only heard about that subsequently. Um, I think we've got to be careful uh, arguing that um, this is only a uh, discussion about public opinion and that we should weigh public opinion because we have to weigh the law. And what the decision notice talks about is the council's public sector equality duty, and in particular, um, the fostering of good relations between persons who share a protected characteristic. Now, I'm another middle-aged white bloke, so I'm not going to lecture you about racism. Um, and I, I welcome the input from um, Michelle Thomas. I think that's been helpful this evening. I can tell you that I've had other correspondence from um, black and ethnic minority people um, who don't agree with her position and who are who have written to thank me for making a decision to take it out. Um, I will uh, obviously after this meeting uh, go away and consider whatever recommendation members bring forward. But one thing I will say is that this council has to make decisions. It can't hide in the process and avoid doing things which are unpopular with sections of the community. And one aspect of this decision is that there was a report in the Daily Telegraph um, very soon after the decision was made and before I think it had even been publicised, which was about the activities of, of an individual who is well known to members of this council. Um, and that report was going to say that this council had decided to leave the plaque intact. So that would not have reflected very well on this council in terms of what that story was about and about the Black Lives Matters campaign. And it was only because we'd moved quickly and made the decision that we were able to say to the Daily Telegraph, no, that's not us, that's Wolstairs Town Council. The uh, Thanet District Council has made a decision to remove it. Now, a decision has a process. This process is ongoing. I'm listening to what people say. And I just want to say, I've done my research into Uncle Mac. Um, I had a gentleman who wrote to me um, and I had a long argument with him. I won't name him, but he's a, a media personality. He was convinced that Uncle Mac's plaque was a celebration of the BBC entertainer, children's entertainer. Um, and he really would not be told otherwise. Um, and he got quite angry when I proved it to him with a cutting from the Thanet advertiser to prove that um, the, the plaque was unveiled in, in 1950 and that Uncle Mac had died in 1949. So I have looked into Uncle Mac as the leader and as the decision maker. I can tell you that there is some material, publicity material around Uncle Mac, which I, I won't share with this meeting because it, it contains language which is wholly inappropriate and would be unacceptable now and therefore doesn't support some of what's been said about um, respect being shown. Um, I'm happy to share it with members privately if that's what they if, if they would like to see it. Um, and um, that is in my mind when I'm considering the decision. 
But I will, but I will say the decision has to be made against the council's public sector equality duty, and not just on the basis of of public opinion. Um, it's not a referendum. We have to follow the law. That's what I need to say. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, Councillor Everett. Um, a number of people wish to speak. Um, Councillor Linda Piper, I'll cut you off before, so let me bring you back in first. Uh, thank you, Chair. Uh, I feel some of my research has been uh, already said by uh, Councillor uh, Saunders and uh, Councillor Piper. Uh, I'd be interested to know where our leader got his uh, information concerning Uncle Mac. I trolled the uh, internet for it. And much of my research uh, was based on a book written by Black Minstrel in Britain by Michael Pickering. And I, I think that um, Uncle Mac entertained people in Broadstairs for those many years to emulate the black music that was popular at that time. Broadstairs Council actually gave uh, uh, Uncle Mac a platform on which to perform to people. And these black minstrel troops were popular all over the country. And I think we ought to be uh, very aware of labelling people who remember Uncle Mac and those people who were entertained by him and his relatives. We must be careful that we don't offend them by uh, slurring their character as if they were racists. I think the decision on either getting rid of the Mac or keeping it should be based on the criteria that will be put in place for subsequent plaques. So when the working party comes up with the criteria that is to be used, uh, I, I think we need to be very aware of different residents' perceptions of what that plaque means. Thank you very much. Thank you, Councillor Piper. Councillor Scott. Uh, thank you, Chair. Um, I mean, just a brief comment and then potentially on the topic that we're about here today, a suggestion. So, yeah, I mean, I believe in balanced views, always listening to both sides of the story. Also, there's many more. Um, I will admittedly say, I, you know, if this has only ever been brought to the attention due to the media. Otherwise, I have to admit my ignorance in this. I have done my research and I've certainly gone on to um, the media websites and taken on board some of the public opinion I've seen in the comments. And really, I think this is a decision that us as councillors should be making for everyone. This is obviously a public um, issue where people do feel strongly about this one way or another. And personally, I feel that maybe if this is something the council can do, put out this to a public consultation, um, given obviously the options for removal, um, obviously the options for retaining, the options to make retaining it and keeping it with an amendment or putting it in the museum. Personally, I feel those would then be the most democratic way. Um, so that's how I feel. It should certainly be a public consultation on this matter, as it's been a sort of brought up quite hugely. Okay. So, Thank you, Councillor Scott. Thank you. Um, Councillor Wing. Thank you. I think we're missing the point a bit. I mean, Michelle spoke, Michelle Thomas spoke uh, very well around the issue. And actually, she didn't recommend the removal of the plaque. And I think the plaque is a bit of a red herring, really, as well. I hope I'm not going to get too slated for this because I've had enough slating today already. I believe it's the process which is vitally important. OK, and I think the working party and whatever process we get to to make a decision about whether that plaque stays or goes, that is the crucial thing. And that process needs to involve a, a cross section of our community, including our black and people of colour within our community, who clearly, uh, who, who clearly are most affected by this. Uh, whether we like it or not, we do have, racism does exist within our communities and we need to acknowledge and I also feel we need to acknowledge that each and every one of us has the has the potential to to have views that that could be considered racism racist and if we keep that in our forehead then we can check keep a check on ourselves uh, I mean, sorry. I, you know, 
in going can, through the process can, of, of organising this can, can, we, can I stop you there, please? Um, we're just going over old ground a bit here. I, about... Will you just let me finish, please? In no, going no, sorry, I, as a chairman, I've asked you to, to stop for a minute. Um, I fear that we, in the previous agenda item, we've actually covered the need to set up a working party. We said that we're going to consult widely. You know, we're going to look, look at who should be included in that. And this agenda item is simply about the process that Councillor Everett may or may not have gone through. So I, don't, I think we should get back to, to that particular point. And in fact, I think that's what you said as your opening comment. So if I could uh, let you carry on now. Thank you. I, I just think that in order to in following a process that would involve the working party, we 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 as as people would better understand the issues that this that 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 are involved, and most importantly, we might find ways in which we can tackle these issues together within our communities. Uh, that's what I'm going to say. Thank you, Councillor Wing. Uh, Councillor Hopkinson. Thank you, Chair. Um, one thing I think is really important here, a point that's been made by a few people, is that this decision does need to be seen to be being made by the community. And a, a few points on that, you know, um, so this decision was made by the democratically elected leader of the council, who, as we've just seen, is quite happy for it to be called in by this committee. Um, no one's mentioned the fact that there is a petition with 662 uh, signatures at the moment uh, of people supporting the removal of the plaque. So I think those things together do add up to a reasonable democratic process. And I say that because I think Michelle Thomas's point is really important. And I, you know, this is my impression from social media as well. It is really important that the Thanet community does feel like this decision is being taken democratically. But I would say that, you know, those things that add up together to, as I say, they do actually add up to a, a reasonable democratic discussion. Um, I also think we need to be really clear because there's been a bit of equivocation around this. You know, the practice was racist. I don't really think there's any debate about that. Um, that doesn't mean there's no musical value or things like that. Well, Hopkinson, I, you know, that, that's an opinion that you're passing there. And again, we're, we're starting to go down a path that we don't need to. We've already said that we're going to set up a working party to look at the right way of handling these things. This is simply to deal with the process that the leader went through. So if you've got points on that, uh, yeah. that subject, carry on, that's fine. But But please don't start making sort of statements that are nothing to do with this particular uh, decision. Well, I, I, the reason I was, I was mentioning that is because that leads into my opinion on what we should do as, in terms of the one of the two options that is on the report. Um, and I do think there's been some equivocation about that, and I don't think there should be. And at the same time, I don't think that, mean, that means, it doesn't mean in, in condemning anyone or anything like that. It just means, you know, the, 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 as the leader says, you know, we need to consider the, the legal position um, in terms of whether or not... Um, you know, but we're, we're endorsing any type of, type of discrimination. Um, it seems to me that of the two options, um, obviously, you know, there is the option of, of wishing to take no further action. I do think there, you know, there is a, there is a case to, you know, preserve this aspect of of Thanet's history in context. Um, but I would, um, which means that you know, option one on the, of the recommendations would be plausible. But from my point of view, that absolutely would need to be uh, uh, contingent on on removing it from from any kind of context where it seems to be endorsing the practice as a whole. And I think that could be achieved by putting it in a museum with context, but it can't be, that can't be achieved by leaving it in public. So I would say, you know, to, as you say, Chair, to pin it exactly to what's in the, the agenda report, um, in my opinion, we should either go with option two or we should go with option one with a, with a, with a clear recommendation that it should be recontextualized in a way where it's clearly not an endorsement and in other words taking it out of, of, of a public display as a plaque on, on the street thank you Councillor Hopkinson I mean you've, you've actually preempted really a position that I wanted to get to because I think in the light of everything that's gone on so far that I would like to make to make a recommendation that no further action is taken in respect of this matter until the policy discussed in item six the previous item is implemented seconded Councillor Campbell Thank you, Councillor Campbell. Um, is that generally agreed by members? Yeah. Can I just ask for clarification, Chair? Yeah. Are you, what? sorry, are you, 
do you mean option one or recommendation one? No, or... what I, I'm I'm saying that that we don't have to take either of those options. That we have a new recommendation. That no further action is taken in respect of this matter until the policy discussed in item six, i.e., to set up a working party, is is implemented. So that the work the uh, the, the process that comes out of that working party will be applied to the plaque. I understand. Okay. Is that generally agreed, members? Agreed. Can I make a comment, please, Bob? Yes, I was, I was going to bring you in, Councillor. I, I only brought that uh, recommendation in then because it, su yeah. it seemed appropriate after a Councillor comment. So, Councillor Campbell, yeah. Yeah, just to get back to the actual agenda item, I fully support the actions that the uh, uh, leader took in respect of uh, the actions that were taken um, at that moment in time that prevailed, uh, given the uh, circumstances that prevailed at the time. So I fully support the actions that the leader took at that time, but I fully support the uh, proposition that you just made that we set out a protocol uh, to deal with these issues in future. Okay, thank you, Councillor Campbell. Um, Councillor Wing. Uh, I, I agree with that proposal, but I would like to suggest, given, uh, and I hope I'm not going to offend you, you're both middle-aged white blokes, could, and we had a very eloquent uh, uh, speaker here, could, would, would the two of you like to, to invite Michelle to maybe advise you around those issues, give, given that would introduce an element of uh, diversity into the, the little group? Um, I, I'm, I'm certainly to, happy to take on board that perhaps Councillor Campbell and I could ha have a conversation with, with Michelle Thomas if she's happy to do that. Um, but, you know, I think that, that our remit has got to be a bit wider than that and we'll look at, um, you know, the, the whole range of, of people that we need to perhaps include in this process. I, I, I appreciate that and I think she could help with that as well. Thank you. Okay. Um, Right. Uh, Councillor Hopkinson, you've, you've indicated you want to come back? Um, yeah, just quickly. I mean, I fully support the idea of a working group, but I, I, I don't agree personally with the idea of this issue going to that, because I think we've had a sort of rigor, rigorous enough democratic process for this, for us to take up recommendation two on the, the report, which is to take no further action on this issue. Um. Okay, so uh, basically, you're, you would be voting against the recommendation that I put to the panel. Is that right? Yeah. Okay. Uh, can I have an indication of other members that, that would be uh, against the recommendation? I, I don't see any, so um, I take that as lost, Councillor Hopkinson, but your comments are noted. Um, sorry. Uh, Mr. Howes would like to have a word. Sorry, can I just clarify? By no further action, do you mean no further action to remove the plaque? Yeah. Yeah. Okay, yeah. sorry. I just wanted to clarify that. That's fine. Yeah. Okay. Um, so, uh, Councillor Linda Piper. Uh, You've muted yourself, Councillor Piper. Yes, I muted myself and then was back on. Sorry. Um, my recommendation was the same as yours, Chair, and I fully support uh, what you've just said. Lovely. Thank you very much indeed. Um, members, uh, thank you for your contributions to that debate. I think it was very worthwhile. Uh, thank you again to, uh, to, to Ms Thomas uh, for her contribution and to your leader for coming along and, uh, you know, enlightening us. So thank you very much for that. Uh, so moving on now, agenda item eight. Um, we've got the review of the OSP work programme. Um, members are asked to note the report, um, but I would just, as we do that, um, I'd like to refer you to uh, the list of uh, projects for scrutiny that was suggested by the workshop that we held. Head. Um, they're included in the report. Um, it was just to ask panel members, one, whether with a uh, chance to think about this, whether they had any other suggestions for topics for scrutiny, or, and indeed, uh, if they're happy with the list that we've got here, um, from here on in, uh, there will be a process of assessing these and, and sort of uh, weighting them to, to give us some uh, consideration of order. But are there any uh, on the list that members feel particularly strongly should be first for consideration?
Uh, Councillor Campbell, is, are, you, are you wanting to comment on this particular item, yeah? Uh, yes, please. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Chair. Um, yes, I think uh, the decision that we made under Agenda Item 6 should prevail and be included within that list now uh, yeah. and should be uh, dealt with as a matter of some urgency, given yeah. the current situation. Yeah, point taken. Point taken. Okay, I see no other comment. So uh, can I... Uh, can I just ask that members note the report? Noted. Thank you. Uh, an agenda item nine, forward plan and exempt cabinet report. Members are asked to note the report. Is that noted? Noted. Thank you. Um, members, uh, that concludes the business for tonight. So uh, can I thank you for what's been, I think, a very, very good meeting, very useful. And I hope that we'll actually find a good way forward coming out of, of the items that we've been discussing. So thank you very much. And thank you, officers. And uh, good night to any members of the public that may have been watching the live screen. Thank you very much. Well cheered. Thank you.